This could eventually be the best team in 2020. It certainly could um, vie for the best roster talent in the country. We're talking Ohio State football. We got Pat Murphy on the line from Bucknuts of 247 Sports to break down the Ohio State roster as we are going team by team here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. So please, of course, like, comment, uh, share the videos out on social media, and subscribe. Pat, how are you doing today? Oh, just peachy. How are you doing? <laughs> doing just fine. Pat's got his playoff beard working for us here in June. It's looking yeah, no, good. Thank you. No sports, but I decided to to grow it out anyway, just in in solidarity of of getting sports back. So hopefully, here we'll have we'll have some more soon. And it's a solid look. I I would be patchy with gray and all sorts of different shades of gray and black and brown, and it would come in on certain sides. But that's that's nice and even, and it's a good look. No question yeah. about that. I wasn't blessed with many uh, many great qualities. Uh, I think writing is one of them that I do well, and growing a beard, I've learned. So those are the two things I've got going for me. It's a unique combination, Pat. <laughs> so we have you on for the writing aspect of it, but people will get to uh, marvel at the beard as you, as you uh, run down the Ohio State roster for us. So we're going to start with the easy one, the Justin Fields at quarterback. So that's a give me. No battle there, nothing to talk about. We don't even need to go through the superlatives because they're obvious. Is there any way, other than getting the the, the knee healthy so he can be the true, true dual-thread quarterback that he's been known to be with 10 rushing touchdowns and 41 passing last year, uh, any type of marked improvement that we could expect this year? I think so, and I think you know it, maybe it won't be as, as obvious to, to the average fan, but... I think he spent a lot of time this offseason continuing to look back at, at what went well and what didn't last year. And and there wasn't a ton that didn't go well. He only threw three interceptions, and two of those came in, in the final game against Clemson. So, you know, it's hard to hard to do that. But when you're Justin Fields, when you're Ohio State, you're going to nitpick a little bit and try and figure out, you know, where he can get better. I think decision-making is one thing, and we saw that improve throughout the season. But there were times when he, he put the ball up and uh, – maybe an ill-advised pass that wasn't intercepted or just didn't hit the mark. Um, obviously a second year in the offense, you mentioned his ability to run, which we saw some last year, especially in the bigger games, but that knee injury certainly hampered him in, in the final three games um, after Penn state. So that's part of the offense that we may see a little bit more, especially with no JK Dobbins in the backfield. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're probably going to use a little bit more quarterback run at times, or at least the threat of that. So I think he's, he's, I know he's worked hard this uh, off season, even though they haven't been at the facility very much. Uh, he spent time back at, at home in Georgia, working with various quarterback coaches and, and with other uh, players around the area to, to continue to stay sharp. Um, so I expect him to, to just kind of take that next step, you know, as, as good as he was last year, that was his first year as a starting quarterback. So he didn't have a ton of film to go back and look at and, and whatnot. Um, there wasn't a lot of evaluation you could do from, from year one to year two because he didn't play when he was at Georgia all that much. So now that he's got that, I think that's kind of where you go is, is really breaking down, hey, I could have done this a little bit better. I could have placed this ball a little bit uh, more accurately. Things like that that, that maybe don't you know, come up when, when you're just watching a game casually, but I'm sure the Ohio State coaches have identified areas where he can improve. And much like the argument for best team in the country coming down to Ohio State, Clemson, and Alabama for those three, uh, the argument for best quarterback in the country pretty much uh, revolving around Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields and only those two. I could make the argument, I think just about anybody could make the argument that this team could win a Big Ten championship. I don't know about competing in the playoff, but could win, still win the Big Ten without Justin Fields. And, and so what's the backup quarterback situation look like? Yeah, that, that's probably their their biggest, when we're talking about quarterback, their biggest improvement from a year ago is that they have some depth at, at quarterback. Um, you know, last year, Chris Chuganoff, Gunnar Hoke were, were the two backups, but neither of them had a ton of experience. Neither of them were, were of the same type of Ohio State quarterback level as, as Justin Fields. Chris chuganoff has gone. Gunnar Hoke is is probably the number two heading into fall camp since spring practice was was cut short. But the major difference is going to be they've got two highly recruited freshman quarterbacks that are coming in. Now, those don't those guys don't boast experience, CJ Stroud from from California and Jack Miller from Arizona, but they've got a lot of talent and Ohio State's very excited about the future of the position with those two. I think it's going to be an interesting battle to watch what happens 
come fall camp between those two because whoever wins the the, the number two or number three job, however you want to lay it out, is probably getting a leg up on who becomes the starting quarterback if and when Justin Fields decides to leave after the 2020 season for the NFL draft. But those are guys that I imagine Ohio State will want to get in games um, you know, when, when they have a big lead, especially early in the year, to try and get them some experience and see them in game action. Um, you know, there's, there's been discussion about whether or not one of them would redshirt because you have two quarterbacks in the same class. You know, if, if Ohio State feels like they need to, to play both of them to get an idea of, of what they can do, I, it wouldn't surprise me if they play both of them. They've got another quarterback coming in um, the following year. So redshirting may, may not even be uh, an area of concern for, for this position. But I think you're certainly, if you're Ryan Day and the offensive staff, feeling more comfortable with the depth if, if something were to happen to Justin Fields, just because you have more talent there than you did the year before. Still not a ton of experience in terms of, of college snaps, but definitely more talent. These guys are, are you know, players that will probably become household names at some point during their career. Um, and, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be up to Ohio State to decide how much we see of them in, in the fall. J.K. Dobbins established himself as truly an all-time great at Ohio State at the running back position. Uh, three excellent seasons, but certainly a remarkable all-time type season in 2019. We saw a drop-off that seemed to be noticeable when Master Teague was in the game, comparing him to J.K. Dobbins. That's not to diminish uh, Master Teague's uh, contribution last year at 5.8 yards per carry, almost 800 yards. Uh, running back by committee could be a possibility this year. Uh, kind of run back, run down the candidates and what we could see at running back. Yeah, you mentioned Master Teague, and he was the guy that I think most people assumed would just step in for JK, um, you know, going into 2020. You, you, you're spot on when you say that there was a bit of a drop off, especially in the games towards the end of the season when the, the talent level increased significantly. Um, you know, he, he struggled a little bit against Penn State. Uh, Michigan, the last two games, didn't play at all against Wisconsin in the Big Ten Championship game. And then when J.K. Dobbins got hurt in the, the playoff game against Clemson, Master Teague was, was not very effective. But you're asking a, a guy who was only in his first year of really playing college football as a redshirt freshman to step in on a big stage. Um, and again, like you said, comparing him to, to J.K. Dobbins. So this was the offseason where he was able to earn a spot. But Master Teague hurt his Achilles the first day of spring practice, which obviously – was an issue. Um, it ended up being less of an issue because spring practice got canceled, you know, a handful of days later, but it, it certainly leaves them with a question mark there. Uh, the, the other two running backs on the roster, redshirt or uh, sorry, sophomore Marcus Crowley and redshirt freshman steel chambers uh, were, were going to be the, the two other guys, but Marcus Crowley's coming back from a knee injury. He suffered in early November, wasn't going to take part really in spring practice. Steel Chambers didn't get a ton of carries because spring practice was canceled. And then Ohio State brings in Trey Sermon from Oklahoma, a graduate transfer, who has one year left of eligibility, was certainly a factor for the Sooners, but never became that, that dominant ball carrier. Now, Ohio State really likes Trey Sermon. They recruited him out of high school. Running back coach Tony Alford has a good relationship with him. They believe he can be that versatile back, but he too is coming off a knee injury. So there's a, there's a lot of injury questions that will need to be answered. The, the thought around the Ohio State program is that these guys will get healthy. They believe Trey Sermon's going to be 100% ready for fall camp. When we saw him recently, he looked good. Master Teague was walking without a boot when we saw him enter the facility the other day. So, you know, positive signs for Ohio State, certainly. But until they're out there on the field working, um, it's, it's tough to say where each guy is in terms of the recovery. But, you know, it, it could be the committee. I think early on you'll see that kind of committee approach to running the ball. but you know, if one guy does establish himself, Master Teague, Trey Sermon, whoever it may be, you know, there's certainly the talent in those guys to do it. I think, um, you know, Ohio State will, will do whatever they need to do to move the ball on the ground and win games. And, and you know, the, the approach will dictate itself in, in that facet. Demario McCall produced his best season as a true freshman in 2016, uh, 270 yards on the ground, four total touchdowns. He's effective or could be potentially out of the backfield as a receiver. Do you think they're going to continue to try to make him what the anticipation has been now for four years? Yeah, it's it's, it's been a weird situation with Demario because you know came in as a, a running back that looked like he was going to be kind of that H back, you know, Percy Harvin, Curtis Samuel type role, and never really materialized there. Has has moved back and forth between running back and, and wide receiver. You know, heading into last season, we heard that he was going to be the number two behind J.K. Dobbins. 
And then that ended up going to Master Teague. Um, you know, he, he just has never really fit into one role. This offseason, he's supposed to be moving to wide receiver. Um, but you know, the, the, the thought was that, that he could still operate at running back, especially after the injury to Master Teague. Would he line up there a little bit more? So, you know, I, I think the, the question with him is, is just finding the right fit. You know, they always talk about him as an offensive weapon and finding creative ways to use him, but you have to be on the field at a position to, to, to be used like that. And obviously Ohio state has had a number of other weapons that they've, they've used ahead of him. You know, he's, he's definitely a talented player. I think Ohio state fans will remember his true freshman year. Some of the plays he made granted those were in garbage time, but there was a lot of excitement about what he could do when, when the, with the hand, you just see it in, in fits and starts, uh, you know, it just hasn't, hasn't been consistent. He hasn't seen as much time as, as I think, as I know he would have liked. So, you know, if, if, if I'm looking at how they kind of set up the depth chart, I certainly think he can help running back. Um, you know, maybe he fits in at, at that slot receiver position a little bit, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a guy that I think you got to find at some point a, a spot and stick with it and, you know, let him try and sink or swim with, with one position as opposed to moving him around so much. Cause I don't think that's benefited him or Ohio state throughout his career. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, breaking down the Buckeyes for 2020 as we go team by team and look at the rosters to get you set for week one, which is hopefully about 80 days away. We got Pat Murphy on the line from Bucknuts. And uh, let's move to the offensive line. So we got Brandon Bowen gone, Jonah Jackson, both all Big Ten performers. But this has really been a position, and I know we could go to any position uh, for the Buckeyes on either side of the ball and say it's been well recruited. But I think that there's been a concerted effort to upgrade the offensive line position in the last few years, and it's certainly started to take hold the last couple years after maybe meeting some teams in big games for a stretch of time in which the offensive line wasn't quite up to where it needed to be. For sure. It was definitely a, an area of focus towards the end of the, the Urban Meyer era and, and the start of Ryan Day's tenure to to improve not only the, the guys starting, but the depth so that when you lose two all big 10 players, as you mentioned, you have guys that can step in and, and Ohio State does. Um, Harry Miller will probably be the the left guard and there'll be a competition at, at right tackle. Nicholas Petit Frere, um, a guy who's been in the program for a few years now, you know, is he ready to, to be the guy, uh, you know, a former five-star recruit? Uh, Dewan Jones is, is a sophomore who really emerged last year. Um, somebody who they didn't expect to play a ton um, was, was a, certainly a redshirt candidate last year, kind of a developmental guy. And he turned out to be way better than they expected when, when he did get into some of those late game situations um, when Ohio State had a big lead. And so he'll be in contention for that tackle spot. And then true freshman Paris Johnson, um, another five-star kid who, you know, it's not often that you start at, on the offensive line as a freshman at Ohio State, but he's certainly a guy who's, who's got talent and, and can step into those roles. And, and then those guys will fit in with the returning starters. Thayer Munford at left tackle. He's, he's been very good. Other than times last year, he battled a back injury, which, which really hampered him. And you could see he was just laboring and, and wasn't able to be 100%. He's, you know, hopefully this, this time off will, will help him, um, you know, be ready. Cause I think, you know, he's, he's one of, one of the better left tackles in the country um, when he's 100% healthy. Josh Myers at center, Wyatt Davis at right guard. Both of those guys are, are certainly all Big Ten candidates, if not all American. Um, you know, that, Two of the better young, you know, youngish offensive linemen in the country. I think um, Wyatt Davis is already being talked about as a potential first round draft pick. Um, you know, they're, they're they've both been mentioned as as potential All American type guys. So, you know, the the talent returning is is certainly uh, there for Ohio State. I think that fitting in those other guys will will be the next step. Finding who's going to be the right tackle. Not having spring practice certainly hurt on the offensive line because you want to get those guys reps together, and that's you know as important as any position on an offensive line. So that that will certainly be missed, but they'll have to make up for that this summer and and in fall camp. And you know what, you'd rather have that situation with talented players like they do now than you know you're unsure of who may step in and who may do what and 
and whatnot. So I'm sure Ryan Day and Greg Sudra will have a plan to to get that offensive line, the cohesion it needs headed into the fall. Folks, you love college football. You enjoy what we do here at uh, Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, as we bring on the best analysts across the nation, covering all the teams in the Power Five and best discussion, debate, and analysis around. So please like the video, share them on social media, leave your comments below. Let us know what you think about the Buckeyes, of course, for 2020, and uh, subscribe here. And you hit the bell for the notifications, you know, when we're going live. Wide receiver, Pat. Um, Great position for the Buckeyes in recent years, as it has been for maybe four decades uh, to some degree, but just in terms of waves of players, uh, that's certainly been during the second portion of uh, Urban Meyer's stay and now Ryan Day. Chris Olave, a bit of an afterthought coming out of high school because of injuries. He's emerged as a great talent. Um, Garrett Wilson uh, could be an emerging superstar. Run down the wide receivers for us and, and let us know what I think might be the big concern is not talent, obviously, but it's KJ Hill and the nuance that he provided as a slot guy that just knew what to do was so dependable and replacing that guy isn't always easy. Certainly not. I mean, you know, KJ Hill set the record for receptions at Ohio state last year, you know, for a career. So it's, it's definitely tough replacing a guy like that, but you mentioned Garrett Wilson, the plan, um, at least in the, going into the spring was, move Garrett Wilson to the slot. He played on the outside as a true freshman last year, move him to the slot and let him use, uh, you know, his, his physical attributes, his speed, um, his, his ability to track a ball and kind of do some of the similar things that KJ Hill can do. They're different players. You know, it's, it's certainly going to be different, but, uh, you know, they, they, they've got, uh, they, they've got a nice matchup issue. If Garrett Wilson does stick, in that slot position, Chris Olave, as you mentioned, will be at his his X receiver position on the outside, and then it's you know filling in with with other guys. And Ohio State has a ton of talent that that can step in at receiver. They you know they've recruited that position very well under Brian Hartline, and, and you know he's he's developed these players uh, about about as well as anyone in the country. So uh, you know Jalen Harris is a senior, six five, you know big guy. You know, hasn't had a ton of opportunity at Ohio State just because of other guys, but he was, you know, one of the first receivers, you know, with the first team, I should say, at the beginning of spring practice. Now that you can ask, was that just, you know, giving a senior his his due to start off spring practice, or you know, had he done enough to earn, uh, you know, a, a look there? And I think he he probably has. I've I've heard he had a really good winter. You know, maturity has has really developed for him. So he's a guy. You know, you can't teach that kind of size at, at six foot five. They use Benjamin Victor a lot in red zone situations, and I think Jalen Harris could be that type of guy. But you know, we can list a number of guys beyond him. Jamison Williams, a sophomore out of St. Louis. Cameron Babb, a redshirt sophomore out of St. Louis. Uh, Babb's had back to back years where he's had serious knee injuries. Both of those guys, ironically, being from the same city, were the 13th best receiver in their respective recruiting classes. They'll both look to try and get on the field this year, especially Bab if he can stay healthy. Um, a lot of talent in, in those two. They can they can fit into different roles as well. And then the the freshman class is is about as good as I've seen um, a recruiting class at one position in in a long time. Um, you know, four players in uh, Julian Fleming. Jackson Smith and Jigba, G. Scott Jr. and Mookie Cooper, who were ranked in the top 16 in, in the 247 sports composite at wide receiver. So, uh, you know, in a, in a normal class, normal Ohio State receiver class, Mookie Cooper might be considered a, a future star. Well, he's kind of an afterthought as the, the fourth guy in that class, but all enrolled early. So all were on campus for winter workouts and the start of spring practice. I think you're going to see multiple of those guys play this year. You know, like I said, about as talented of a group as, as I've seen. Um, you know, I know the Ohio State coaching staff was was very happy with what they saw from those four freshmen, you know, just just in the limited amount of time they were on campus before everything kind of shut down. So you named close to 10 wide receivers and yeah. all of them are either already productive in college or four or five star guys coming out of high school. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. You know, you, you think about Ohio State historically, and they've certainly produced wide receivers, um, you know, throughout the, the program's history. But to have this much talent at once, I'm not sure I can remember a time that, that, that that's been the case. And, and then you add in a, a Justin Fields, a Heisman Trophy contender at quarterback, the offensive line that we talked about. You know, this could be a, a passing attack. You know, I've 
compared it a little bit to what we saw with Dwayne Haskins a couple of years ago. Um, but I, I don't think it'll look that way, but in terms of the numbers that it could put up, I mean, this could be, you know, potentially record setting from, from an Ohio state standpoint with, with all those weapons, um, you know, even guys out of the backfield that can catch the ball. It is, there's just, you know, a, about as talented of an offense that Ohio state's had. And then you add in, you know, a guy like Ryan day calling things. And we, we saw how he was able to do that last year and, and the previous two years as Ohio state's offensive coordinator. So on paper right now, this seems like an offense that could do some very big things. Obviously it all has to come together and, you know, work as, as well as it has in the past, but it certainly looks very positive offensively for the Buckeyes. Yeah. Pick your year in the past of Ohio state football, take one of your favorite Ohio state football teams, and maybe you'll see a San Antonio Holmes and Ted Ginn or a gamble playing with a Michael Jenkins. You'll see two really good players who then played in the NFL. Maybe the third guy eventually uh, turned into a good player, but not the waves and waves of players. So right. two things that stand out to me, Pat, would be number two, just the offensive style of football is much different now. You do need four and five guys on the field much of the time as opposed to, boom, you get two starting wide receivers. You bring in the third guy on third and long. Uh, and then also, I think that um, is exemplified in the recruiting rankings, because I've been noticing that if you look at the wide receiver list, you'll see a guy's like 25th or 30th rated at wide receiver and think, ah, he's not that good. Oh, no, he's a top 130 player, like the glut of wide receivers because of the increased passing in at the at the high school ranks. And, and they're they're really sophisticated now even at that level, throwing the football with four and five wides and develop these quarterbacks that the wide receiver play has just developed such uh, at such a high level before they even get to college at this point. Absolutely. I, mean, I think that you hit the nail right on the head with, with what wide receivers and, you know, they just understand and quarterbacks too, you know, understanding these, these spread offenses better because they're so used to them in, in high school. And, and, you know, even guy, you know, Julian Fleming comes from Pennsylvania they weren't in a spread offense. They didn't throw the ball a ton, but you can just see the physical abilities of him. So now you get him working with a guy like Brian Hartline who who can develop wide receivers like we talked about. Now you've got that, that physical potential, that speed. Okay, now we work on routes, we work on timing, work on all that. So it's certainly there. And, and you know, you the scheme wise, um, last year, I don't know how many people realize it, but Ohio State was was in 12 personnel quite a bit because of the ability to run the ball. So one wide receiver, two tight ends um, to get J.K. Dobbins going. From my understanding this year that there will be a lot more three, four, five wide receiver sets. Um, and that doesn't mean they won't run the ball, but you know, they, they certainly will. And they'll use those tight ends because they're all very good blockers. But when you have the number of wide receivers you have, you've got to find ways to get them on the field that's probably your, your best bet for success unless one running back really emerges like JK did a year ago. And, you know, so I think they're going to throw the ball around a lot. I think it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. This is your place for college football talk each and every day here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. So please lock it in, subscribe, as we mentioned right there on the screen, like the videos and comment below your thoughts on Ohio state football as we've got Pat Murphy on the line from Bucknuts 247 Sports, so please join him and the rest of the staff covering Ohio State football. Don't need to fill you in on what the 247 Sports brand is all about. Um, they're among the best.